Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. A few years ago, when Joe Biden was Barack Obama's understudy in preparation for his own presidency, their administration announced a pivot from the Middle East to the Far East, especially with a view to China as the main global competitor with the United States. There has been some delay as Daesh had to be crushed and Iran remained an active foreign policy problem. But now an anticipated move away from the Middle East is back, and this time it may hold. What does that mean for American, Russian and Chinese moves in the region? Will France return to its historic role in Lebanon? How are Turkey and Iran going to respond to these new realities? And, most crucial from us here, what does it portend for Israel? To analyze this topic, we're joined from the uh, United States and Washington, D.C. by Dr. Michael Duran, who is a former senior White House advisor on the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'd like also to welcome from elsewhere here in Jerusalem, Professor Zev Khanin, who is an expert on Russian and Middle Eastern studies at Bar Ilan and Ariel University. Thank you for joining us as well. Pleasure to be with you. And with me in the studio is our TV7 analyst and host of TV7's uh, Watchmen Talk, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding on uh, the expected changes in the near future and what may it uh, forespell for the state of Israel. Well, of course, each new administration uh, sets out uh, its agenda, its uh, priorities, uh, both uh, the global outlook and the regional derivatives uh, from it. Uh, the Biden administration has started doing that. Not all of the nominees uh, have been confirmed and in place yet. And um, in some ways, there is still uh, continuity from the Trump administration. And obviously, if you leapfrog into the past, from the Obama administration. But what we can uh, see already is that the administration does see, as you said, China as uh, the uh, main peer rivaling it, uh, competing it uh, with it, perhaps uh, not uh, today or tomorrow, but obviously for 2030 and beyond. Russia uh, is also meddling, especially in the Middle East. For instance, this was mentioned by administration officials when the US uh, sells arms to its uh, partners and allies, uh, there is an end user Proviso. Uh, you cannot just buy a rocket from the United States and sell it to the next uh, bidder. The Russians do not care. They may sell it uh, to uh, uh, Pakistan in order for it uh, to uh, deliver it to Iran or to, to Hezbollah. And there are, of course, other examples. So yes, regionally, the Middle East is a bit less important. There is also um, a force posture review by the Department of Defense, several of the withdrawals announced by the Trump administration uh, have been halted uh, pending uh, uh, this review. And um, as far as we Israelis are concerned, the um, superpower or big power rivalry will still be here. There were differences, such as the normalization between Israel and uh, several Gulf countries, or the fact that oil is not so important now. The US uh, has become a net exporter of uh, oil. It is not dependent on it, even though the Hormuz uh, Straits and other maritime routes are still important for world commerce. But nevertheless, the administration will try to move uh, with a view, at least from Jerusalem east, from Washington it would be west, across the uh, Pacific. And um, uh, while you have uh, the NATO alliance in, in Europe and the Northern Atlantic, you now have the Quad, China, India, Japan, and the United States as a sort of a mini NATO uh, for the Pacific. This seems to be the center of attention for the Biden administration until there is a crisis with North Korea or Iran or any other source. I'd like to refer the next question to Dr. Duran. To what degree is it realistic at this stage for the United States under the, the new administration of uh, President Joe Biden to move away uh, from the Middle East? Of course, this was also the intention of uh, the, the Trump administration, if it were to continue. Uh, but 
ultimately it's a matter of investment the the uh the finance allocation and investment in in areas of operation have to come at the expense of another uh, area, and currently the Southeast Asia and, and uh, South China Sea are, are more of an interest uh, to the United States in this uh, greater power competition. Do you see this actually uh, bring more of a challenge to the United States also in the near future? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, there are, I think, two different conceptions about the importance of the Middle East in this, uh, uh, in this new era. Um, the conception that I favor um, doesn't make a clear, such a clear distinction between um, the uh, uh, Pacific theater um, and, and the um, Indian Ocean and the Middle East. That's because all of uh, that's because China is a huge importer of uh, oil that either originates in the Middle East or goes through it. Um, that's a huge uh, strategic weakness of China. Um, and all of China's adversaries in East Asia, Amir mentioned the Quad, Australia, India, um, uh, uh, the, the United States, and Japan. Uh, Japan, India, um, and Australia are all importers of oil uh, from the Middle East, as is also uh, Taiwan and, and South Korea. So what the Chinese really want to do is they want to uh, turn that, um, that strategic uh, liability that they have in importing all that oil into an offensive capability. In addition, the Chinese calculate that uh, uh, that you know the Chinese are rivaling the United States um, in in naval matters. They don't have a quality of a, of, a, of a navy that can defeat the United States, but in terms of quantity of ships, they're starting to really rival the U.S. They calculate that you know, every carrier group that's tied down in the Middle East is one that's not going to be used in, in East Asia. The, the um, Chinese-Pakistan relationship here is a key. There's the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, uh, Pakistan is an ally of China. And they, they are building a port in Gwadar, the Chinese are, from which they are going to uh, take resources from, Pac uh, from the uh, Indian Ocean up through Pakistan and into China, so as to shorten their sea lines of um, the, their sea lines of transport, which are a, a, um, a liability to them. Gwadar also sits um, very close, within striking distance um, of the Straits of Hormuz. At the same time, the Chinese have a base in Djibouti, which is just a few miles, really a stone's throw, uh, uh, from the Bab al Mandab, which is the uh, controls the approaches up to the to the Red Sea. So if the United States pulls out what's going to uh, of the Middle East or pulls back, what's going to happen is the Chinese are going to move in very quickly and they're going to move in, I believe, together with the Iranians. I mean in con concert with the Iranians. That's the that's why the United States should be very concerned about the Houthis in Yemen because that's an Iranian proxy like Hezbollah sitting not just threatening Saudi Arabia but sitting right on the Bab al, uh, the Bab al Mandeb. Um, so that's one view. The other view says, well, we can just kind of pull back. We don't need the Middle East anymore um, as, as much. And there's no connection, the, the alternative view says, between Russian and Iranian power on the ground in the Middle East and Chinese power. And in the alternative view, my view, is that the, the, the Chinese are using the Russians and the Iranians as stalking, as stalking horses. Indeed. Uh, Professor Khanin, I'd like to hear your take on this. Also from the aspect from the Russian perspective, of course, uh, uh, the United States, according to figures of 2019, uh, spent uh, over t uh, 780 billion U.S. dollars on its uh, military ma might and power projection, of course, uh, with uh, capacity to deploy uh, quantities of forces uh, overseas. China has invested second uh, to the United States, about $247 billion. Uh, and then uh, Russia, not ranking third necessarily, but in, in the top five, uh, with about $67 billion U.S. dollars invested in its uh, military uh, uh, might. Nevertheless, it somehow is able to uh, establish some kind or some sort of power projection using uh, the, the, uh, its... Uh, vessel state, if we may call it that way, in Syria and, and other countries in the region uh, to maneuver uh, on a global sta uh, scale. How do you see the Russians still competing within that list of three uh, powers, if uh, at all? Well, uh, first of all, uh, 
Okay, if you will review uh, the opinions uh, that were produced uh, at the beginning of this year uh, by uh, various uh, Russian think tanks and declarations of uh, uh, Russian public figures in Moscow and uh, uh, around the Moscow uh, concerning the situation in the global politics and uh, in general uh, and in the Middle East specifically, uh, we can understand that uh, the Russians actually paid first, first attention uh, to uh, what they hear from Washington, uh, that Russia uh, remains among the major enemies of the United States. Uh, so from this point of view, Russians are interested to strengthen their relations or strategic partnership even uh, with the uh, Far Eastern powers, first of all China, and uh, to continue their rapprochement with the Japan. Uh, that's on one hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Moscow, are not very much happy uh, with the fact of uh, uh, China, China's uh, extension uh, westward and uh, China presence in the Middle East, especially in the points where the, which Russia see uh, as uh, their um, uh, territory of their exclusive interest, uh, like uh, um, uh, cooperation in the field of cooperation with the Gulf for monarchies and uh, uh, in, in Syria, of course. Uh, and of course, the, what was mentioned uh, by Michael, uh, uh, the one where we're talking about China's presence, uh, strengthening the China's presence uh, in the northeastern Africa and Djibouti and places around that. Uh, so, according to the Moscow, as far as Moscow point of uh, interest is concerned, it's like uh, you know they might be interested to have uh, uh, to bring the situation back to uh, uh, that happened before the 2011. Uh, many people in Russia now remind uh, what was said by the Russian Empire Alexander I uh, in 1801 when he came to power after the coup d'état uh, in military coup d'état, which assassinated his father, Paul I, uh, when Alexander II said, "При мне будет все как при бабушке." I will manage things, my gra which my granny uh, Catherine the Great managed. So the Russians are interested uh, to manage things. Uh, like they were before the Arab Spring. Uh, and uh, many people there, many people in Moscow, uh, which made review of uh, uh, opinion papers uh, that were produced by American and Israeli and Turkish and Iranian think tanks, uh, like uh, our, our INSS, Institute for National Security Studies, um, uh, which product uh, uh, reassessment of Middle Eastern policy, regional policy. Uh, so many are talking about the same uh, uh, axis. You know, uh, uh, meaning those uh, which are uh, Iranian-led axis uh, of the Shia powers, uh, Turkish-led bloc of uh, semi-Islamist uh, powers, uh, together with the Sunni bloc, of course, uh, talking about Muslim Brotherhoods and Qatar, Hamas, and Aza, and so on and forth, so forth, so forth. and uh, Sunni pragmatic countries, first of all, uh, uh, Gulf monarchies. Uh, uh, they, of course, exclude the, uh, exclude the fourth, uh, meaning radical Islamists. Uh, like uh, Islamic State and so on, but they still believe in Moscow that they will be able to balance between the three first. Uh, and this is the pri priority, this is the major uh, opportunity uh, for Moscow as they see it now. Uh, of course, they are not going to um, uh, develop their military involvement in the region uh, because they understand, uh, and it's really funny, more, many more people, uh, uh, more than before, they are talking about that uh, uh, for them it will be to win peace, it will be more, even more difficult than to win the war, uh, uh, as they see the situation in Syria, for example. Uh, that's uh, at the moment we can say uh, that in spite of the fact uh, of this uh, military strength that you mentioned before, uh, at the moment I would say that they believe to sit and wait. Indeed, uh, Mr. Oren, how do you uh, see this complexity when uh, you see more Chinese efforts to open a naval base, for instance, uh, in the area of Bab al-Mandab, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Duran also mentioned, the strategic significance of Yemen at the time when uh, President Joe Biden talks about uh, ending the war in Yemen, uh, ending uh, U.S. Uh, uh, support for the Saudi-led offensive uh, operations. 
ending also military sales uh, to both uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Well, the United Arab Emirates, obviously, is uh, the biggest uh, uh, market uh, in the Middle East that uh, procures uh, beyond uh, weapon sales from the United States. And then you have the Chinese who are uh, coming in with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, seeking to increase investments and, and seeing how they can uh, play uh, the, the chess game of, of this region. Do you think at this stage uh, the, the greater power competition will be translated into shifting alliances on a global scale when we're talking about this region? We do uh, injustice to American primacy when we mention the United States, China, Russia, and all the rest in the same sentence. Because there is still the United States, and then comes the rest of the world. Now, of course, this optical illusion has to do with the fact that there are five permanent members of the Security Council, each uh, having a veto. By that token, France and uh, Great Britain, if it is still great, uh, have uh, the same power. But this is not uh, so, especially since Israel needs the United States in an overwhelming fashion. It is dependent on American assistance, even though the 10-year uh, memorandum of understanding um, at the amount of almost $40 billion altogether is already set in stone. But nevertheless, it needs the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It needs it uh, in its diplomatic battles um, at the UN, uh, not only uh, Security Council and General Assembly, but various bodies, the International Criminal Court, the Human Rights uh, Council, and, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and because of that, uh, the Chinese-Israeli relationship is a point of friction between Jerusalem and Washington. And Jerusalem... Uh, would have to do Washington's bidding uh, if it comes to that. Up to now, it has managed to maneuver between the two giants. But uh, if it has to choose the way it already uh, did some 20 years ago, when it bought uh, a Russian plane and tried to sell it to China and um, had uh, to uh, revoke uh, the contract during Ehud uh, Barak's uh, term in office uh, in the year 2000. It was embarrassing, but it was inevitable. And um, while Russia is still around here militarily in Syria, having to de-conflict with the Israeli defense forces, with China, it is mostly economic and diplomatic. So if there are tensions between the United States and China, Israel will have finally to choose a side, and we all know uh, who we, this is going to be. Which is also, among others, the importance at this stage for the state of Israel, uh, at least uh, to uh, insist on a credible power projection from the United States towards the Middle East, regardless of its uh, priority list of, of uh, sectors Well, you of know, insisting, insisting is too much of what we all know as chutzpah. It is not for Israel to try and set national security and foreign policy goals of and course. priority for another country, especially not the United States. Israel can present its case and uh, hope to convince not only the executive branch, but also Congress. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Duran, how do you see that? Well, um, I would um, make a couple of distinctions. Um, the, the United States is certainly much more powerful militarily than, than the, uh, the rivals, and particularly in the Middle East, it's much more powerful. But, let me, but let's look at two cases. One is Iraq. Um, look at all of the um, uh, blood and treasure that the United States expended in Iraq. And today, the Iranians might be more influential in Iraq than the United States. And the United States is in, you know, is, is in danger of pulling out entirely from, uh, from Iraq. Now, that's quite amazing because the United States is much more powerful than Iran. Iran is, an, is, a, uh, uh, is a poor third world country, and, uh, and yet it's rivaling the United States in, Iran, in, in Iraq. And let me add another factor there. Between uh, 2010 and 2018, China in, um, increased its investment in one Arab country by 1,000%, much more than it invested in any other country. 
That country was Iraq. Uh, very few people know this, that they, how much they have invested in Iraq. So what's happened is that the Iranian militias on the ground, which uh, Barack Obama's policy turned a blind eye to, um, have created an environment which is inhospitable to American companies. The United States cannot go in and invest in, uh, uh, in Iraq because the Americans will be kidnapped or killed. But the Chinese can go right in there uh, comfortably. Um, it's my view that the Chinese understand this and they have, an, uh, they have a relationship, uh, an understanding with the Iranians about this. This is one of the ways that Iranian power works to the advantage of the Chinese. The other case I would point uh, your attention to is Syria. Uh, you know, by by American standards, the force, the packet of force that the Russians delivered to Syria was minuscule. And as we saw in one of the exchanges between the Americans and the Russians that took place in the Deir Ezzor region, the United States can wipe the floor with the Russians in Syria. But we're not going to do it. Uh, and we don't want to do it. And under again, under Barack Obama, the United States all but recognized Syria as a Russian-Iranian sphere of influence. Unfortunately, the Biden administration is coming back into the region with that same general picture of the Middle East, which is going to have the effect of increasing the power and influence of the um, of the Iranians, and together that with the with the, the with the Chinese. So. Take a look at their first their their first decision. One you know that they that they took you know, before they were even had their um, the Biden administration took before it even had its officials in place was to review the arms to Saudi Arabia and and the UAE and then fo they followed that up by uh, announcing an embargo on on arms to Saudi Arabia that can be used in Yemen. That that is all in the name of the humanitarian concern about Yemen. But what about the what about the Houthis? What about the Hezbollah force that is being built up there? And like I said before, that's a force not 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 only that can use precision guided weaponry against Saudi Arabia, but it's also a force that could be used to under the under certain conditions close down shipping in the Red Sea. That's that's bad for Israel. That's bad for all of America's allies. It's bad for Saudi for Saudi Arabia. The 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 Biden administration has decided um, uh, against all reason to uh, identify the Saudis as the cause of the war in Yemen without any without talking about the uh, without talking about the Iranians at all. This is what I think the Israelis have to worry about. The, we, we know the playbook from the Obama administration. The Obama increased mill to mill cooperation with Israel and he increased um, some some forms of intelligence cooperation with Israel told the, the supporters of Israel in Washington, look how much I love the Jewish state. I'm putting it in a big bear hug because I love it so much. Meanwhile, he put the Russians, he had a policy that allowed the Russians and the Iranians to set up shop on Israel's northern border, and he allowed the Iranians to all but take over in, in Iraq. None of, and, and meanwhile, we have the JCPOA, which is going to, which, which, which provides Iran with a legitimate pathway to, to, uh, uh, to a nuclear weapons program within a, very, a few very short years. Uh, all of that is really bad for uh, for Israel. It's bad for the long-term presence of the United States um, uh, in, in the Middle East. So I think I, I agree with uh, Amir that the, it's, it would be chutzpah for the Israelis to tell the Americans what to do with their forces. But I think what the Israelis need to do is they have to present a uh, a, a picture of the region to Washington uh, that doesn't allow the Americans to say they're really supporting Israel by uh, by putting it in this bear hug, but ignoring the rise of, uh, of Iran and China all around the region. Some may say it's creating the circumstances for better R&D of F-35s, but uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor Hanin, to what degree do you see currently the the situation evolve in a uh, in a, a, a place where Russia would once again uh, perceive the Middle East as uh, what it was during the Obama administration, with all uh, what Doctor uh, Duran just uh, mentioned, where suddenly there is an emerging vacuum once more, with the United States seeking to lead from behind, shifting its. Uh, uh, focus from this uh, uh, region uh, to a certain degree to the South uh, uh, China Sea, and uh, ultimately have the uh, the the playground uh, to once again uh, capitalize upon past policies. 
Well, you have uh, different political factions, in, uh, in including the foreign, pol in the foreign policy elite in Moscow. Uh, they might disagree about everything, but there is one common ground which they agree. Uh, they agree with the fact, or it's better to say, they agree to disagree. Uh, they disagree altogether with the fact that uh, Russia simply uh, filled the vacuum which was created by the United States when they moved uh, the focus of their interests uh, in the old world, from the Middle East to Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia. And in, in this way, um, you know, uh, freed the ground for uh, development of the Russian interest. Uh, they in Moscow believe all of them, all factions. Uh, they believe that uh, they just continue with their own strategy. And uh, maybe uh, um, uh, American move just uh, uh, help them or make it a little bit easier, but it doesn't make any big difference. Uh, so they're still interested uh, to um, uh, uh, to uh, to play as a sort of a, a balance force between different groups and camps of, of, of the interest. But in Moscow, they understand that they are unable to solve any problem, any conflict. So I'm more, they're more interested uh, in uh, uh, conflict uh, management rather than conflict solution there. And uh, uh, from this point of view, they are trying to uh, go, um, uh, first of all, uh, to show that they will be able to solve issues uh, better than any other forces are able. That is why, again, they're talking in Moscow about Palestinian problem. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting uh, that they're talking about um, a, a revitalization, if it's possible to say in these words, um, uh, the role of the Middle Eastern uh, Quartet, mm -hmm. you know, that there are uh, four, uh, uh, four forces um, uh, that were involved in the uh, is Israel-Arab conflict solution, and especially in Israeli-Palestinian conflict solution. Uh, and to add it with the so-called Quartet of uh, uh, Sunni monarchies. Um, uh, the Russians are interested to play a sort of a uh, um, combinator uh, between these two forces. Well, Professor Hanin, uh, this is unfortunately all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to take immediately the opportunity to thank uh, both you, Professor Hanin, and Dr. Duran for being part of today's panel, as well as our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.